Good evening, everyone. This is so much fun. Two of my favorite people, one of them home in Virginia, one of them home in Wyoming. <laughs> I'm here in my office in Scottsdale. The magic of Zoom, we were just bemoaning the fact that we weren't all together here in Scottsdale so we could have the after party. But I am going to raise <laughs> a glass of my lovely South African rosé and toast you both. In the nice. Spot, I'm thinking you would be here. <laughs> here. <laughs> I have boring water. <laughs> Same. I'm hydrating. Come on, guys. You've got no imagination here. It's late enough to be drinking. It's mm. really painful when I do the British authors because it's like eight or nine in the evening and they're swelling away and I have like a cup of tea. <laughs> it's just, it's like, <laughs> out of sync. Um, but anyway, so Tasha Alexander, let me hold up a copy of her book because the actual sign books from both Tasha and Deanna are somewhere in transit to the poison pen but not actually here. So uh, Tasha's book, The Dark Heart of Florence, has a beautiful cover. I don't suppose anyone could ever resist the Ponte Vecchio, can they, when they're doing Florence? No. I, I think it's required by law that if you write a book about Florence, that, that they have to have the Ponte Vecchio. Either that or Botticelli, so. I know it's like a saguaro if it's Phoenix, you know, there's just no escaping it. I can't show you a picture and it's too bad because the cover is beautiful, but Diana, Deanna can of her new book because um, I had to read it as a printout. I don't have a lovely advanced reading copy. Show us your cover. It's just beautiful. There it is. And maybe Deanna, you could explain because the imagery is so interesting. Why do you have like a snowy alp and a person in climbing gear? Because we have a Victorian female mountaineer uh, who is central to the plot of this one. And uh, they gave me a beautiful cover as always. And they gave me the exact shade of blue that I asked for. Sometimes I get to make requests and, uh, and they indulge me. They're very, very good to me. So I have my, is my beautiful blue cover. Why is the blue significant? The blue actually came about because I am, uh, I am besotted with Mary Berry. I love Mary Berry and was watching one of her, um, one of her shows that's not Great British Baking Show. She uh, went to do Country Houses of England and she was cooking in Powderham Castle and it's the seat of the Earls of Devon. And the staircase hall at Powderham Castle is painted a very distinctive shade of blue that's actually called Powderham Blue. When I'm watching this and I'm thinking, that would make the most gorgeous book cover ever. And so I made note of it and I sent the, the link to uh, my editor to pass along to the art department. And this is powder and blue. It's gorgeous, Which, large. It's yeah, like and I think it's evocative of, of, you know, a wintry scene. So it worked out really, really well. I loved your little mythical kingdom. I mean, I have been to, <laughs> I'm trying to remember which of the tiny kingdoms is it that is adjacent to Switzerland um, and Austria. It's not Andorra because that's the one further south, but what's the little- Well, it, it's, you know, I took a little inspiration from Liechtenstein, a little inspiration from Luxembourg, um, and most of it is just completely fabricated. It's, it's super fun to create your own country. I highly recommend it. <laughs> it actually is. No, I definitely <laughs> agree. Um, and as I, I've said to your publicist, I, I actually, remember vividly the prisoner of Zenda. I didn't. I, oh, yes. Both editions, the one with Douglas Fairbanks yep. and the late, what is it, 1930s or something. And then the remake was Stuart Granger right. and Deborah Carr and James Mason, who was always such an oily, oh, yeah. know, but classic <laughs> British villain. I mean, James Mason was truly wonderful. But I couldn't help but think of Rudolf Rassendel and the whole. Oh, yeah. I reread the book. Uh, when I was kind of getting into the headspace to do this, I was like, oh, we've, we've, we've got to have some Zenda vibes here. Just, to, you know, because every one of my books has uh, at least one small element of homage to something that I've loved, uh, you know, with, and, and if it kind of creates that for the reader, if you know, you know, like they'll recognize if they've read those same books, they, they get it, it'll click and they love it. And it's, it's like a special little in for them. Uh, and if people are not familiar, then they may go running out and buy it and, uh, and kind of rediscover something that's been lost for a while, because I don't know if anybody's actually reading Prisoner of Zenda anymore. Anthony Hope in 1890 something or other. However, yeah, but when I wrote up your book, I did remind people of both movies and, you know, and the <laughs> 
they watch love it. it. So we'll come back to why the prisoner of Senda is working so well for Deanna. <laughs> Um, you've actually moved out of the Victorian era. Technically, now it's 1903. You're Edwardian. Yeah, I really, I never thought, like, yeah, I never thought Victoria would die back, you know, gosh, in 2003 when I was in a Garrett apartment in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I never thought Victoria would die, but uh, but she did. So we're we're fully Edwardian now, which, you know, if you're a woman in Britain, didn't really make a whole lot of difference, but there we are. <laughs> well, but it does make some difference politically because, you know, part of the, part of what you're now looking at is the gradual recognition of Germany rising up as a, as a real threat. Victoria is not there to control her grandson if in fact she ever could. <laughs> um, certainly his mother, Victoria's eldest daughter, you know, the princess royal, has had no luck with Willie trying to swat him down. But um, this reminds me a little bit of, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the first really great espionage book, which is set in the Frisians, you know, where it's the Irish author. I always do this. Patrick, you can, you can fill me in on the chat thing. He's the, the author who was assassinated or who was executed by the Irish in 1919 for being a traitor. But he wrote this wonderful espionage story where they were just beginning to suspect that the German Navy was a threat. And so they're cruising around in the Frisian Islands to, to check in on that. So why, why would it be true that in Florence, the German occupation? Ah, there he is, Erskine Shoulders, The Riddle of the Sands. I just love this feature of Zoom whenever I flub up. <laughs> after Patrick chase me notes and saves me from his sister. The Riddle of the Sands, honestly, it's a great story and it holds up today, but it's, um, it's a very early recognition. I think it's 1905 um, that the German threat is coming before the British even began to think about it. Yeah, well, you know, once you hit the turn of the century and Victoria dies, there was something that was actually called spy fever that gripped um, Britain. And people truly believed there was this, there were some novels written. There were, a, a, there was an endless litany of pieces in the Daily Mail, not too surprising, about how the German spies were everywhere in Britain, that each of them had picked out their little <coughs> plot of land that they were going to live on in Britain after, um, after the, the, the Germans defeated Britain. Now, this is before anyone is thinking about World War I, but, uh, but the British really took this to heart and there was a real feeling in, in the empire that Germany was going to be a huge, huge problem for, for British sovereignty. So did, when you started out, did you really think about Colin as being a secret agent? I mean, obviously he wasn't in the first book because she's still, you know, um, a widow and it's a while before Colin really becomes an integral part of her life. But did you always envision him as kind of a secret agent? I did. And, you, you know, I think when you start when, when you write your first book, you, you, you can't really think, oh, this will be this long running series because that's just hubris and you're inviting disaster. But I always had in the back of my head that there was more to Colin than Emily could see initially. And even now when they've been married, you know, more than a decade, if you're married to a secret agent, you're never going to know everything. You can't. You can't know everything. So we get more pieces of what he does for the empire and for the crown, but Emily can't ever really know all of it because that's how it works if you're married to a spy. Yeah, well, it's almost like, you know, the Official Secrets Act is involved here, um, even if it's informal. So Deanna, um, you know, did you, did you think about Veronica or um, her guy? Um, fulfilling the kind of plot that happens in, in this book, i.e. a mission for the crown as opposed to some <laughs> other kind of murder mystery? Um, I think it's a, it, you know, it's like Pasha says, you write the first book in the series and you never know exactly where things are going to take you. Um, the most you can do is kind of set things up. And, and sometimes I'm, and I wonder if this is true for Tasha, because sometimes I go back and I'm astonished at things that I put into place that I can make use of that I wasn't necessarily 
mapping out, but they're really, really helpful later on. Um, I, it did occur to me because of Veronica's connection with the royal family and the fact that she has this relationship with Special Branch, that she is a good person to send in for the odd um, chore that isn't appropriate for someone with official standing. She is a she's a good person to kind of come in and um, fulfill a, a little bit of a fixer role uh, from time to time when things are too delicate or too personal uh, for somebody else to kind of get on board with. Uh, when you don't necessarily want a record of something being fixed, Veronica is, is your girl. But this is that's in that whole British tradition of sending in, you know. Um, uh huh. Right. I don't, I don't want amateur is not the word I'm looking for, but non-professional people. I suppose part of it is because the upper class already had incomes of their own or presumably had incomes of their own. So they didn't have to be like salaried government employees. They could be. Oh, exactly. You know, plus there's there's very much once you reach a, a certain uh, level of society, there's this idea that, you know, we're we're in this together. A gentleman's word is his bond. And, and you you kind of you know, you, you can see each other across the crowded room and you know what that person's standards are, you know where they went to school, you know who their sisters are, and, and there's an element of trust there that you wouldn't necessarily extend to someone who's in a different class level unless you've gotten to know them really, really well. You know, there's a, there's a shorthand, the way we do shorthand regionally, the British have tended to do it class-wise. So, um, it, it just kind of makes sense that, that Veronica would slot in there and, and kind of uh, be a person that they have uh, come to rely on sort of against their will uh, because their relationship with the royal family is, is uh, a little precarious, to say the least. Quite precarious, actually. <laughs> and you... Oh, you probably have to say that again because... I, my internet was making you go, hey, uh, 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 uh. are we losing you? We might be. Oh, no, I, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I was, I was going to say that you really have this tradition in Britain that goes back centuries yeah. of noblesse oblige. If you are in the upper class, you are supposed to be protecting crown and country. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you take James Bond, right? James Bond is a gentleman who is independently wealthy. He's so rich that he can afford to keep an RAF mechanic. This is in the books, obviously. He has an RAF mechanic on retainer so that he can, anytime he wants, drive his Bentley 90 miles an hour. <laughs> so there's this idea that goes that's really ingrained in the culture that if you are in the upper class and you have the means that you do what, what the empire needs you to do. Um, and that's how I had really always envisioned Colin and that when Emily first meets him, she sees that he, as he, as he likes to say to her, takes care of matters that require mo a modicum of discretion, but he's actually doing a lot more than that. Um, but she can't see that right away. But, but you do have this wonderful tradition in the empire of, of people stepping up and doing what they think needs to be done. Now we can debate today whether or not those were good things to be doing, but certainly at the time, everyone thought they were, or at least British thought they were. So in your case, since Colin and Emily have children, it's also handy that there's that whole tradition of governance, uh, governesses or tutors or private schools, because it'd be pretty hard for them to be floating around Florence doing what they're doing in this book if they were dragging the kids along. Absolutely. And, you know, anyone who's had small children knows that a governess would be extremely useful if you want to be zipping around the world, saving the crown. <laughs> um, but also at that time, it would have been considered extremely weird if you were home paying attention to your children. That was that was not thought to be good for the children even. And in fact, uh, Jenny Churchill got, you know, who of course was American, she got lots of flack because she was way more involved with her children's lives, you know, Winston and his brother, than, than what the British upper class thought was appropriate. You know, we Americans are always coming on in and, and, and messing up what people think they should be doing. So Deanna, to raise an indelicate question, since Veronica... <laughs> 
um, has a has a pretty good sex life. Um, and she before Stoker, before Stoker, <laughs> she was clearly so. Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of contraception was available to the Victorian woman other than abstinence, which is clearly not what she's doing. No, um, there were a number of barrier methods uh, and prophylactics. Uh, you could use the rhythm method. You could chart your cycle. Um, you could use, there were um, some basic spermicides that you could use. You, there were um, condoms have been around for a couple of hundred years before this. So there were, there were lots of different things you could use. There were um, different um, preparations that you could uh, insert. Uh, I'm, I'm trying really hard to be, to be tactful here. To be delicate, um, right. No, I get to be it. Delicate. <laughs> yeah, there, there were. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, a lot of those um, family planning methods were actually advertised in newspapers. Um, even abortifacients were advertised in Victorian newspapers, but they were always advertised as, you know, um, preparations for ladies uh, and, you know, medicines to bring on your courses. And so it was right there, front and center in the newspaper, hey, this will get rid of an unwanted pregnancy if you have one. Um, but women who, who were in the know and who actually talked about these things would share knowledge and could prevent pregnancy. It's just that it was considered to be a not very ladylike thing to talk about. So it's not knowledge that was really shared and a lot of people discussed, but you know, that's why you have in the middle classes, you tended to see much larger families. Whereas in the upper classes, these are women who had access to information. They had the money to spend on these things. And so they tended to have fewer children because in some cases they were actually engaging in family planning. Uh, it was just, it was one of those things where you could, and it, it run the spectrum. You could go to your wedding night having zero idea of what your husband actually had in his trousers or you could be completely prepared um, and know exactly what was gonna happen and just tell your husband, you know, I'm, I'm not ready for, for children. So we're gonna have separate bedrooms for a couple of years. There, there were a few notable brides who did that. Um, and so that was, that was another method that, that you could use if you were completely um, averse to the idea of, of having children. I know one of the things that uh, Queen Victoria raged about when uh, Vicky, the Princess Royal, uh, married Frederick is that she got pregnant immediately and Victoria was absolutely livid because she herself had not enjoyed her pregnancies. She greatly uh, deplored the fact that she got pregnant so quickly after marrying Albert and she wanted Vicky and Frederick to have time together to kind of be as a couple, enjoy their marriage and within just two months of, of marrying, you know, young Vicky's pregnant and was actually a little nervous to have to write and tell Queen Victoria, you know, hey, mom, uh, a grandchild is, is, is on the way. Uh, so there, there were expectations in some quarters that you could put these things off if you wanted to. And, you know, the fact that Veronica is a, a natural historian, she's a scientist, uh, she certainly understands as much as you could at the time of the biology. Um, and, and I feel like Veronica is the sort of person who would have zero compunction about asking um, an experienced person who does this for a living, hey, how do you prevent those complications? Because a, a number of courtesans were extremely successful at avoiding pregnancy uh, and, and did a very good job, made a very good living without any of those complications. So I feel like Veronica has had some conversations on her travels and learned, no, learned a thing or two. <laughs> Natasha, what about, you know, Emily and Colin have had the one set, but um, one has to assume that they too are not trekking around the world with her pregnant. Oh, no, they are not. And, you know, sometimes complications occur after a difficult birth that makes that no longer possible. And if one has had twins in the Victorian era, I don't think that's, you know, a shocking development. So, yeah. Right. But, well, you know, this certainly this was a thing that, 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 that women dealt with and not everyone was getting pregnant all the time. Although in the kind of the height of the Victorian era, half of brides, half of middle-class brides were pregnant when they got married. So there was also a certain degree of, of not being as concerned about sex before marriage as we would maybe like to think the Victorians were. 
Well, you both have couples with relationships that are certainly healthy. Um, so I think that's part of the fun of reading them. I really do. But children issue comes up a lot when you have a woman as your lead character. Um, so I just thought I'd bring it up. I was thinking, you know, abortifacient was actually a key element in Poldark, if you remember it, when not Demelza, but the, um, the woman that Poldark had been in love with forever, um, you know, decides to abort her baby and, and it ends up killing her. Um, so it wasn't necessarily safe. Maybe people who lived in rural areas were more dependent upon, you know, the elderly lady in the, in the hut with her basic remedies than maybe the rural, the city people were more sophisticated. Anyway, um, let's talk about what actually happens in the book. So Deanna, you've created this wonderful kingdom called the Alpenwald, which I absolutely love. Um, and how does Stoker and uh, Veronica get to the point where Veronica agrees to um, take a role that one would not expect her to be doing? <laughs> well, you know, the, I had set up this organization called the Hippolyta Club, uh, known colloquially as the Curiosity Club, and it is an organization for extraordinary women. Uh, and so it has botanists and other scientists it's got poets and mathematicians and um musicians and painters and women of 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 all kinds of exceptional abilities and one of the members was a victorian mountaineer who um has according to what stoker deduces really early on been murdered in the course of her latest um uh, expedition. And so it happened to be in my fictitious Alpenwald. Um, and so that leads to complications from the Alpenwalders themselves, uh, including their hereditary princess, who is their head of state, um, who bears a striking resemblance to Veronica. And, uh, and that leads them into some, some complications that, that gives Veronica an opportunity to see what life might have been like if she had been recognized officially by her father and if she had uh, kind of grown up within the bosom of that family um, and, and, and quite a bosom it is. It is, so <laughs> there's a major Alp um, in Alpenwald and it appears to be- The one, they just have the one, Barbara. They only have the one mountain. <laughs> exactly, but my point was, it's um, a rite of passage for the Alpenwalders apparently to climb this mountain mm -hmm. um, and, and they get a badge or I was thinking about that when I got my second Pfizer shot and they give you a little bit of that to me, but we haven't gotten away from that. See, right? it was an accomplishment. Yeah. You have to wear it around. Um, yeah, absolutely. So there is a specific badge that people who have yes. climbed the Alp in the Alpenwald managed to get, which I thought was great. But the other, the other thing I thought was interesting is what in the world did women wear to climb mountains when they had to be, you know, in, in basically Victorian dress, what did you decide that well, they were wearing? Well, what I decided they were wearing is what they were actually wearing. Um, I was inspired by two Victorian climbers in particular, Annie Smith Peck and Fanny Bullock Workman. Um, they were extremely different women. Annie had to fight for every nickel she got to fund her expeditions. Fanny was wealthy and married. Um, and, and they were they would race each other up mountains sometimes and whoever got there first would plant her suffragist banner um, because they always seem to be competing for the same space. Um, but one of the things that I learned, which was absolutely fascinating is the very first woman to ever summit Mont Blanc was wearing a full skirt, a black feather boa, a velvet hat. I mean, he, the hamper of champagne. Um, it was so over the top, fabulous. I absolutely loved that. As the century wore on, and you get later into this golden age of mountaineering, more and more women were climbing. And what they decided to do was they would set off from their base camp or the village that they were in, in a, in a skirt so that they looked respectable. Um, because mountain, mountaineering was not a hugely respectable occupation for a woman to engage in because you had to be alone with men. It was physically very vigorous. Um, but a lot of these women would take the skirt off once they got out of the sight of you know, the casual passerby, and they would figure out a place to stash it where they could grab it on the way back out. Now they could go up that mountain, they could be up there for half a day, they could be freezing, they could be caught in storms, they could have run out of food, not even sure they're going to survive. But by God, they grabbed the skirt on the way back down and put it back on so that they would look respectable when they came back into town. 
Um, and then they would they would just climb in trousers like men did uh, for the for the the hard parts of the climb. But uh, they always had to have that veneer of respectability, which is just so ridiculous when you think about it. Well, you know, we were before bloomers and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, Tasha, um, why why is Emily in Florence? I mean, sometimes Colin once or twice, like in your Russian book, um, Emily had to do like a rear guard action in order to manage to get to St. Petersburg. But in this one, is Colin taking her along? You know, is he happy with all that? How did they manage to get to Florence? Well, he is happy with it because he and his his boss, shall we say, have orchestrated it. Um, he needs to go to Florence for work and he needs some cover. And the perfect cover for that is a, is a holiday with his wife. But of course, he immediately asks her to invite her friend Cecile, um, a Parisian of a certain age who's violently elegant. And that tells Emily that there's more going on than Colin is letting on, but she's used to there being, you know, if you're, as we were saying before, if you're married to someone who you know is involved in covert work, you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that you can't know everything. Now, for someone like Emily, this does not mean that she is going to sit by quietly and let him do his thing without her doing her thing. And so they are ostensibly going on holiday in Florence, staying at Colin's daughter's uh, Palazzo, which is um, a wonder in a wonderful location in the city. Um, but she knows that something is up. So she doesn't, she hasn't had to, to machinate her way in to, to the investigation in the same way that maybe sometimes she has to, because she has been willingly brought along by him. So you have a wonderful time taking them to um, other countries. I mean, we've been in France, we've been in Vienna, we've been um, somewhere in Greece, we've been in Pompeii. So currently you have a fondness for Italy. Um, and now we're in Florence. <laughs> were, these, were these, you know, destinations that most well-traveled English people would, would actually would normally go to? Absolutely, they really, well, other than, than Santorini in Greece, I mean, if you were doing your grand tour, you would go to Greece, but you might not necessarily go to Santorini, but Florence certainly was one of the, the prime destinations for any English traveler on a grand tour. This is where you get, you know, room with a view. Um, you get the whole notion of Florence being this overwhelming place. There are all kinds of British uh, travelers who write about getting to Florence and being overcome with emotion on seeing the city, on being in the Fitzy Gallery, on, on, on gazing on all this wonderful art, that they're just overwhelmed by the city. And it's, it's really kind of a funny thing because I know what, for me, I had never been to Florence before I was sending Emily to Florence. And I got to Florence um, and I was by myself. Andrew was meeting me a few days later. And I arrive in Florence and I, I had rented an apartment and I get there and I dump my stuff and I start walking around. And my first impression was I thought, yeah, this is definitely a city built by bankers. There's something <laughs> very, very it, 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 it is, it is the city of the Medici, right? Mm. It, it's, it's architecture. You know, if, if you think about Venice, Venice is this city that is impossibly beautiful. It's insane. It shouldn't exist. They've pounded logs into the, the lagoon floor so that they can build these palaces on, on, in the water, basically. They have marble gutters that, that weigh so much that it, it is a serious risk in terms of the buildings actually sinking into the sea. Florence is nothing like this. Florence is very staid. Florence, Florence is more like the, you, at first glance, she's not the stodgy sister because she's not stodgy, but she does not grab you and shake you and say, my God, I'm so beautiful. You must pay attention to me. It's the more of an understated elegance and beauty in Florence. 
Um, you get the color of the stone and the, the Florence Hines were very, very proud of their city. And, you know, one of the things that they, they talk about a lot in the Renaissance is that the buildings are built from stone that is quarried from within the original city walls. They're taking the silt out of the Arno and using it to make the mortar. They're so city proud, um, but they're not flamboyant in the way that, that say Venice is. It's a very, very different kind of city. Yeah, but both cities are so permeated with art, with fabulous art. You know, Venice, really more painting and some remarkable architecture, but Florence, you know, we think, I mean, to this day, you know, it's painting, but it's also sculpture and, you know, all kinds of amazing things and also great food. So um, that part is always exciting. But in my memory of Florence, and I still actually have a pair of them, is that it became a glove making capital. And they had a terrific history yes. of working leather and making fabulous gloves. And, you know, so much of, of the Renaissance and all was, was all about clothes, um, about fashion. In fact, it's amazing how fashion determined lots of economics and, you know, lots of fortunes. I remember when Rob and I sailed down the Columbia, we got to Astoria. And Rob, my husband, who grew up on Park Avenue, said to me, why is it called Astoria? I was just like, really? You're asking me why it's called as good? I was just like, whoa. Um, but, you know, the fur trade built, an, you know, one major fortune here in America. And, you know, you think about ostrich feathers and what happened, uh, whatever fashion trends drive so much. Um, and, and Florence, I've always thought, was like um, under the Medici and all, just a place where people like Elizabethan England, fashion was so much a part of, of what they did. So um, Emily likes clothes. So, you know, is she touring fashion or art galleries while she's in Florence with Colin? She's really kind of doing more with the art than the clothes, but the clothes really in the Renaissance in particular, I mean, this is where, this is how families showed their wealth. This is how families showed their power because you didn't have access to these kinds of fabrics, the silks, the leather, um, the, the, I mean, there were dyes that were only used for wealthy families. You could get arrested if you were not of the right class and wearing fabric dyed with certain dyes. Um, and in fact, in the Renaissance, you would have a wedding procession when, when a couple got married. And of course this was beyond, beyond the sort of Victorian arranged marriage. This is an ally a political alliance between families. And, and if you look at Florence in the Renaissance, if we think about Romeo and Juliet, where you have the, the, the Capulets and the Montagues fighting on the street and literally killing each other. This is what Florence was like at the beginning in the early stages of the Renaissance, late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. You had gangs of young men, primarily based on their families, who just went around fighting each other and killing each other. And in Florence, there came a point where, where the merchants, because you remember Florence, like I said, this is a banker's city, right? This is a town built by merchants who trade and banking especially become the most important things for, for not just their personal um, fortunes, but for the city's fortunes. And the merchants in Florence eventually get to a point late in the Middle Ages, early Renaissance, where they go to the town government, the city government, because they're a republic, Florence is a republic. And they say, if we don't do something about these gangs, all of our businesses are going to fail because no one can go through the city because you have these marauding gangs of basically unruly teenage boys who are killing each other. And it's really bad for business. So the government actually squashed these gangs and, and put all these laws in place that made it so that the individual families no longer had so much political power. And I mean, they still had political power, but they couldn't go around killing each other so that, so that the merchants could go about conducting business. But what you get after that then is that this, the same families are still powerful families, of course, um, and they still have the most money, but when they arrange marriages, 
these are political, these are business oriented marriages. And the, there is an actual wedding procession leaving from one palazzo going to, because in, in the Renaissance, you actually didn't, in Italy, you didn't get married in the church. You just, it, the, the, the wedding ceremony was kind of just a, a thing in your house, but there would be this pr procession where they literally carried the bride's trousseau through the streets of Florence. So she is going to be dressed in this unbelievable gown. She's going to have a parade of chests behind her that are decorated. Uh, that was the thing that Botticelli did. He decorated the chests that would hold the trousseau to be paraded through the streets. And these young women who, you know, we think about the rough road that women have in Victorian England and how women say in Pericles' Athens didn't have a great voice in society. I would say that probably the women in Renaissance Florence, they probably had it the worst of any women that I have studied through my entire career. They weren't even supposed to look out of windows because a man might see you looking out the window and isn't that trashy. Oh, uh, and now you've been trashy looking out the window. So by the way, now your family, you're trashy. Your whole family, it, it is. So they, they couldn't even look out a window. And this is pre-Savonarola who makes it even crazier. Uh, but they get to pick the artist that decorates the chest that their trousseaus are in. Um, and Botticelli was one of, one of the favorites. And so you get this sort of interesting that these women have really, really got no public role. They barely even have a role in their family, honestly. I mean, they manage the household, but they, you know, you, you think about Victorian women who are the power behind their political husbands. These women were not that. Um, they are living in a much more restricted lifestyle, but they still are really engaged with the art in Florence, which is so, so important culturally to them, but also to us. I mean, we think about Florence, we think about Michelangelo, and we think about Botticelli, and we think about the Duomo, and how did someone build a cathedral with a dome that big when, when they didn't even know how it could be done at the time that, that, that you, you, you know, Brunoskelli is getting the commission to build the Duomo. He has no idea how to do it, but he's like, yeah, figure it out. Um, but so somehow in the midst of all this, that culture and that art is getting to the women somehow, as we see from the chests that their true selves are in. Well, there was, um, that's all background because what we really have in this book is Colin as a secret agent taking Emily and her friend along as kind of a screen. And they check into this beautiful palazzo and astonishingly, somebody dies. <gasps> so um, it goes on from there. Veronica, you also, um, Veronica, sorry, Deanna. <laughs> I love that. Um, so we haven't really talked about what happens, but we've got, um, we have got Veronica and Stoker um, and, and an exhibit is being arranged. Do I have that right? Um, a woman has died falling off the Alp in the Alpenwald. Yes, yeah. my, um, my Victorian mountaineer, Alice Baker Green, has um, fallen off a mountain. And uh, Veronica and Stoker are tasked with putting together the kind of the memorial exhibit right. uh, at, um, at the Curiosity Club, because that's what they do when one of the members dies, is they kind of have a, a whole, um, an exhibit devoted to their lives, their accomplishments. Um, and a lot of her things have been chipped over because she was staying in the Alpenwald while she um, uh, engaged in this last expedition. She'd been climbing there a lot. And so they're the ones who have to put everything together. And it's Stoker who realizes from looking at her climbing equipment, things are, things are not okay. Things are not copacetic. A murder has happened. And so they end up getting involved in that regard. Um, and so there, there are some... Uh, there's a, a, a lot of hearing around London and, uh, you know, a little uh, light breaking and entering, uh, as you do, and um, a few other diplomatic engagements. We get to take them to the opera, uh, which I love to do from time to time. So, uh, and I got to create my own opera, which is always fun too. So, you know, I got to make my own country, make my own opera. There's, uh, I mean, there's a lot to love when you get to just 
conjure these things entirely uh, out of nowhere and uh, play God a little bit. And I mean, I got to do the flora and fauna of this country. I got to do the folklore. I got to make up uh, the animals that live there, the, uh, their patron saint who has an otter. So they have otters rampant on their coat of arms. Um, yeah, so I had, a, I had a lot of fun playing with this book. Well, I can certainly see that. And then you bring the <laughs> royal visit to um, to uh, to London and Stoker and Veronica are then involved in the Alpenwald royal family, which is where we come back to the prisoner's end of it. I don't want to spoil anything. So we probably should, should leave <laughs> yes, it we do. there. Yes, we do. It's, um, we do. it's really um, a lot of fun. You don't you don't take them. I mean, they have been off on the island. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful book, sort of Rebecca-ish book and whatever, but you haven't really taken them well out of England um, on some kind of expedition. Although Veronica is so well-traveled because she's been around the world, how many times does she say? Oh, I think around the world completely, at least three times by the time she's 25. Yeah, she was in, uh, she was in Java when Krakatoa erupted. She's been, um, there's a, uh, a little, um, I have a, for people who pre-ordered the book, there's a portal you can go into on the internet uh, that has some exclusive Veronica material, and there's a diary entry of when she was in Costa Rica. She's she's been all kinds of places, um, but it's a running joke throughout the books that all she wants to do is get back out there. And every time the poor girl packs a carpet bag and grabs her butterfly net, something happens, and she keeps being stuck in London. Um, you know, with these fogs and the gaslit streets and, and trying to kind of, it's the first time she's ever lived in London. And she's been there for two years now. And she's kind of adapting to life in the metropolis. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing joke at this point, because Stoker is very much the same way. You know, right. he, he led an expedition to the Amazon, he was a surgeon's mate in the Royal Navy. So he went around the world on, on, you know, the HMS Luna and was involved in the bombardment of Alexandria. And uh, all kinds of good things. So he's um, he's had his share of travels. She's had hers, and yet they just keep getting stuck in London. Um, and every once in a while, like you said, they had an island off the coast of Cornwall for an adventure. And uh, um, the one I'm writing now, they actually do get out of London. <laughs> they, they do get out of London for a little while. Um, but we'll uh, we'll see if they get further afield one of these days. Uh, Veronica, in a in a little kind of interregnum period between two of the books. Veronica has made a quick visit to Madeira uh, and back, which is a, a, a very good place to butterfly. Uh, but she also had an ulterior motive for going there. So yes, yeah, she did. Uh, she's got one little there. one little trip uh, since we've known Veronica, bless her. I feel like she's getting oh. a little cabin fever. <laughs> Another time, because I think we've used up our time talking about other stuff. I would love to know how you've learned so much about taxidermy, because, you know, Stoker, obviously, this is his passion. Oh, you should see my library. <laughs> you actually I've done amassed yourself? a lot of books. Have, yes. you, have you tried your hand at actual taxidermy? Uh, no, I'm terrified. Um, I'm terrified uh, to actually try it. But I do have, um, actually, <laughs> hang on, I'm going to show you something. Okay. A few months ago, I had a reader contact me, and she is, by trade, a mouse taxidermist. And she made a Veronica Speedwell mouse. Fabulous. She even has she even has a little butterfly in her, in her. She has a knife in her in her belt. She has a little tiny flask, just like Veronica always carries. Um, and she's got little daggers in the back of her helmet for suitors who um, who prove a little um, a little too overbearing. So I have I have a piece of time. I would be terrified. Now she goes to great pains to tell people the mice come from the local raptor rehabilitation center. So they have been used as food, and all they do is send her the skins. So the um, the the mice have gone to feed uh, birds of prey that are being rehabilitated. So she's getting something that would have just otherwise been thrown away and making art out of it. Um, and and so I have a Veronica Speedwell taxidermy mouse now. Fabulous. <laughs> I love it. So, no often wall it's very, badge, but, it's so. very intricate. It really is. Yeah. And she the fact and she actually made because Veronica carries a little gray velvet mouse 
wherever she goes. It was a little token given to her by her father, un unbeknownst to her for a couple of books. There is a little tiny, little teeny tiny gray mouse tucked in Veronica's bag, Veronica Mouse's bag. So this the artist big, hit all the notes. She, all she didn't miss a trick. <laughs> Well, the Victorians had a huge interest in natural sciences long, along with the industrial revolution that was going on. And so I can certainly see why lepidoptery and taxidermy, you know, would be important to them. There were big collections of that kind of thing. Absolutely. Let me sum it up, Patrick, from the dark well. Um, Patrick, do rejoin us and see if there are questions or comments you'd like to forward. I am here. Um, yes, there are, actually. That mouse is terrifying, by the way. He's a, um, she's adorable, Patrick. Do not diss my mouse. <laughs> um, okay, our friend Lisa Holstein asks, so this is for Deanna. She says, I love Veronica and Stoker, but I want to hear more about the, the book with the four female assassins. <laughs> um, so that is uh, the book that is in, I have two books that I'm currently writing right now. One of them is Veronica Seven, and one is my first contemporary, which is about four 60 something female assassins who have to band together to take out the organization that has employed them. Um, and that one is looking to come out late summer of 22. And that's all you get, Lisa. That's all you get. That's all I'm allowed to say at this point. Uh, let's see, Margaret asks, um, love both these series. She says, I'm curious how many Veronica Speedwell books Deanna has plans for. Do you have an Oh, as many as they'll let me write. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm doing seven now and I have, I mean, there's scope to do a, a couple dozen more if I, if, if they let me and if I want to. And, uh, so yeah, as long as, as long as we can do this, then we'll be doing it. Cause I, I love writing these characters. They're great fun. Here's a question for Tasha, uh, Margaret. She says, um, what was the inspiration for Colin's daughter appearing at this time in the series? And will uh, she and Emily's relationship develop further? I expected more tension in the previous book because Emily's difficulty with Christiana, uh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading that, and how hard it was for her to overcome that. Well, actually, you know, it's funny, Deanna, you were saying about how you, you look back at what you've written before and all this stuff is there. And when, I wrote the third book in the series, A Fatal Waltz, which is set in Vienna, and where Emily encounters Colin's former mistress, who in fact is his his daughter's mother. Um, that I, I was kind of going back and, and just revisiting things in the series when I was deciding what to write next, and and I was I was just struck by wait a minute, how as we were talking about birth control a little while ago. If Colin had this extremely passionate affair for many years with this woman, it's not unreasonable to think that there would be a child. Um, and, you know, Christiana, Kat's mother, the daughter, um, she was a spy too. And she did not want Colin, who she did love, to be in danger. And if you're, if you're a spy, if you're an asset like that, any tie that you have makes you vulnerable. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, Christiana absolutely would have hidden the child. And only when she's an adult is she going to find out who her father is. And so it was really just a question of, of timing. I was taking the number of years from when she would have been born and, and, um, uh, I guess the Pompeii book was 1903, and that was putting Kat at the right kind of age that that she would have gone to, she would have been informed by the solicitor who her father was and would have gone off looking for him. And so that is why she appeared then, because earlier than that, she wouldn't have been old enough. It's interesting. And Emily is not happy about it. I was just saying, um, you know, if your if your husband has a kid, what are you going to do? He has the kid. The kid's there, right? You can't make her go away. All right, let's see. Well, here's a good question for Deanna. Um, do Veronica and Stoker ever hook up? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, if, if you guys have seen any of my events, you know I never, ever, ever give out spoilers. Um, but yeah, of course. <laughs> 
yes, of course. This is where we were leading. Yes, this is this is a thing that has happened. Um, but it has happened prior to this book. So uh, yeah, they they um, they have certainly kind of uh, crossed that particular threshold. Now, what that means for them is is uh, is that it's a very interesting complication uh, at this stage because we have two people who uh, have been. It's not so much that they have baggage; it's that they have giant steamer trunks of baggage that they both haul around. They both are commitment phobic at this point. Um, and so seeing how that vulnerability um, affects each of them individually. And, and remember too, Veronica is not a romantic person. Stoker is the one who reads French novels uh, you know, for the for the romances, he he loves his his new French romances when they show up in the post, and he's very sentimental, um, and he carries around you know his his big red pocket handkerchiefs and his his tins of sweets. Um, so he's he's our um, our sentimental character. Um, so how will his prior wounds interact with his you know tendency to want to be? A soft and 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 smooshy kind of person. Uh, that's uh, that remains to be seen. It would be worthwhile mentioning that everybody has previous romantic history. Emily's a widow, and mm -hmm. Colin, we now know, has a mistress and a child. So you know they were not like a virgin couple at eighteen. And you know Veronica has obviously had a fairly active love life. A life. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and Stoker is married. In fact, that's been one of the drivers in, in the series. Stoker is a divorced he's, fellow. Yes, he is. Yes, is an unfortunate choice. And then interestingly, both of you have chosen uh, to have characters who, who are illegitimate, um, you know, were born mm -hmm. illegitimate, whatever, which puts them on the outside of society in some respects. So I think well, it's that very liberating because when you have a character who's not absolutely expected to do right. a, you know just by virtue of their birth there are certain things that they're going to be restricted from there are certain places where they're not going to be welcome there are certain expectations they will never be able to meet i can see where if you have a character who is strong enough um, and self-actualized enough that they will look at those limitations and say fine you don't want me i don't need to be there I don't need to be part of this world and kind of take that as license to push their their behavior wherever they like because they've already uh been told you're not going to measure up to this standard so okay fine throw the standard out i won't measure up to any of your standards it's so it's liberating when you're when you're writing them because you can you can let them do things that ordinarily uh victorian people might be inclined to you know, to behave and you can let your characters not behave, which is a lot more fun. Sounds very contemporary, actually. Mm -hmm. in a lot and of yet ways. very of the period. You know, the bar, the bar period. sinister, the bar sinister is very liberating. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of the reason I wanted to bring Kat in as, I mean, yeah, she's a legitimate, but she's also not part of British society. So she doesn't really care what they think, except that it might annoy Emily, which is, which she likes that. But I wanted to also bring her in because, you know, Emily and Colin are, are quite radical for Victorians, but we're in 1903 now. We're Edwardian. And Kat looks at them and they, to her, will always be these stodgy Victorians. Even though they're radical for their time, she is gonna push those boundaries even further because she's Edwardian. She's coming of age in a completely different era from when Emily did. I have a question from uh, Jamie and she asks um, for Tasha, how old was Emily at the start of the series? Now that I know 10 plus years have passed since the series began, I imagine she must have been even younger than I expected when Philip died. Yeah, I kind of, I, I always, uh, when I started writing, I took some very sage advice from Elizabeth Peters, who said that she had always regretted saying how old Amelia was in the first book, because it really, it really tied her up. So I've never said how old Emily is in And Only to Deceive, but she's young. So she, yeah, I mean, so you can kind of figure you know if she got married at the kind of time that if she's 
coming out of mourning in 1890, you know, she's maybe 20. She's not very old. But you know, it all it's all very relative. I remember I was at an event once and um, some wonderful, wonderful readers asked me how old Cecile was. Cause they said, well, Cecile, Emily's dear friend is a woman of a certain age. And so they said to me, so is she like 30? And so, you know, when you're 20, 30 seems like a certain age. When you're 40, 60 seems like a certain age. So age is such a weird relative thing. So Emily is, is probably younger than you thought at the beginning, but, but I'll never go on the record as saying exactly how old she is. Because I always think of Amelia and Emerson climbing the pyramids, right? And you do the math and you're like, they're like 75 now. But I always picture Amelia and Emerson as like 40, so. To me, I don't care how old they're supposed to be. They will always be 40. <laughs> well, she even had to make a point of the fact that Amelia was dyeing her hair at one point to keep it black because, you know, you do the math and you know she's gray. Barbara, didn't didn't you have a great story about uh, Barbara Mertz? Wasn't that her real name, Barbara Mertz? Mm -hmm. And how she, she stopped flying when they wouldn't allow her to smoke on the plane anymore? Is that true? <laughs> yeah, she, she was. She and my husband, the contrarian, had a great relationship. We, we had many encounters with Barbara, went to visit her a couple of times in her home. And I have to tell you that her beautiful bathroom in the upstairs part of her house was all painted as an Egyptian scene with gorgeous lotus flowers and all this <laughs> other stuff. I asked her if I could take a photo of it because I didn't want, you know, it's a personal space you don't really want to invade. But... She was fabulous. And in fact, yet I asked you that question about contraception because um, we just, she and I discussed that one time because the Victorian Egyptian explorer, the female that um, she modeled Amelia on was- Amelia Edwards. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And then there was another one, but I said to her, you know, how did these women go off on these long, long expeditions, you know, around Egypt and so forth and not have to deal with childbirth? And she said, well, the only real, the only real way to do it was abstinence. Everything else. It was the only foolproof way for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, that's always sort of stuck in my mind. I know she was a fabulous person. I'm so happy to have gotten to know her for as long. And when Dana and I went to Egypt last a year ago, December, to um, research one of Dana's books, and I was sort of along for the ride, we, we each took our two Amelia Peabody books with us. Um, along with Death on the Nile, that was our required <laughs> for the trip. And you know what? Those books really hold up. And one of the great things about historical fiction is it doesn't date. You it's always have to, Yeah, I mean, you know, other books, we've had so many conversations over the course of, you know, 31 years about authors and dating age problems, you know, just, is it a real, you know, in real time, are we aging every year and all kinds of things. But the great thing about historical fiction, it's already aged. So, you know, you can have them like a month between events. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, the pandemic, a big question that comes up in these conversations, you don't have to write about the pandemic. You could write about cholera in London or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think there are a lot of advantages to writing it, but also I think it's very comforting to read historical fiction at difficult times. Because you know what happened. And the thing is, so is. Really yeah, absolutely. Right you don't know what's happening. You know, it's so hard to live in this kind of constant anxiety, but in historical fiction, it's already happened. So it's much well, more. Well, I think there's a I think there's a sort of comfortable exoticism to to historical fiction. It's just different enough to make it feel like a real escape. But there, there are familiar elements enough that you can you can identify and you can relate. And so well, yeah, you know, and when you get, a, when you get good right. resolution. You know, I mean, 1903 is not 1503, you know, mm -hmm. so your books are both um, yeah. more contemporary. Well, that, that was one thing with the, with the Florence book. Um, the, the Renaissance parts, chapters of, of the book, in the 15th century in, in Florence, you had the Black Death coming back at least once a decade. And, you know, we're so, think about how we're dealing with COVID. Imagine if for like the next hundred years, we had a pandemic that, you know, once a decade came in and killed half the population. I mean, it's, it's that's, that's a lot to deal with. Patrick, anything else? Uh, yeah, uh, a couple of people have asked uh, 
Deanna, are you get, do you have any more uh, Julia Gray books planned? Uh, no, not not uh, not planned. Um, they I left my previous publisher when they declined to publish anymore, and we got done with the 1920s books. And uh, new publishers like new stories, and so that's how Veronica got started. Um, so there are no plans, no firm plans. Um, never say never. Uh, I, I, you know, publishing is such an odd business that um, my my mother swears that the mantra should be expect the unexpected uh, because you just never know. So there's no firm plan for more Julia at this point. Um, but like I said, I would never rule anything out uh, completely. So good. Um, let's see. Jordan asks Tasha, um, um, you have Emily going to Egypt next, but is there another? ideal location you would take her okay I, I jordan i hope that's you jordan jordan and i rendezvous both in pompeii and in florence so um emily has always wanted to go to egypt i would say i mean i'm i'm tossing around ideas but i've always wanted her in a scottish castle someday cool let's see <laughs> this is funny janet has a question for barbara she says uh, for Ms. Peters, is that a Beatles glass you're sipping from? No, it's actually a hand-painted wine goblet that um, my husband's cousin gave us as a wedding present. Um, and it's so classy, I use it as my bathroom glass, but I also like it on Zoom <laughs> because regular wine glass is so transparent, but it's got gorgeous colors in it. So I wonder, I wonder where they got Beatles out of that. I'm not sure. I don't, um, it's not Beatles. It's actually just... Um, Picasso-esque, yeah. yeah, right. Let's see, anything else here? Um, hmm. Well, why don't I do a reminder while you're looking that we do have autographed copies of The Dark Heart of Florence and what is it called, A Perilous, sorry, I don't. Um, we are at an unexpected peril. Thank you, I knew peril was part of the book. <laughs> here's, a, um, yeah, here's, a, here's a question. Yeah, I, I put links to both books in the comments field. Oh, thank uh, you. And um, yeah, for Deanna, uh, Margaret asks, um, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. She she appreciated the nod to Jane Eyre. Uh, there's a quote, reader, I oh, carried yeah. him. Oh, yeah. Um, she <laughs> says, do you have any other, do you have any other fun uh, nods to other literary classics in your books? Oh. You know, nothing that is that specific. Um, that moment presented itself. Uh, and it's a moment where they're in a burning building and Stoker is completely, he's been knocked unconscious. And the only way they can get out is for Veronica to physically remove him herself. And the idea of writing the line, reader, I carried him, was just, there was no way I was going to let that go past. Um, and and that's, the, that's the line that gets, uh, Jane Eyre lovers, that's what I hear from. Uh, because they know it instantly. Um, there are always homages in my books to things that I have loved. Barbara and I were talking about this earlier. Um, anything that was formative for me. So if you have read those books, you will probably be aware of them. Uh, you know, the, um, the one that was set off the coast of uh, Cornwall on an island, uh, a dangerous collaboration. That's because of the fact that I grew up loving uh, Du Maurier and the very early Victoria Holtz that were always, you know, set on some stately manner on a crumbling coast of Cornwall. Um, so there's always going to be an Easter egg somewhere. Uh, you just have to know to look for it. I'm so glad you mentioned Victoria Holt. I read every book she ever wrote. And she also wrote is Philippa Gregory, if I remember right. Wasn't that her 16th? Philippa Carr was Sorry, her, Philippa, um, right. when she wrote yeah. her historical fiction, her saga, right. her family saga. And then Jean Plady, when she yes. was doing her Queens of England. The Queens uh, of England, right. Yeah. yeah, the Philippa ones were the um, 17th century. Um, but I just loved her as Victoria Holt. I always thought, yeah. you know, she was an amazing person. Talk about another person with pseudonyms. And she died at sea. <laughs> And, you know, she did at and, 90. And I'm thinking, yeah. what a glorious Still way to writing, go. died at sea, and was slipped overboard. And I thought, perfect. I just And I keep that. hoping she had a wonderful tango with some some gorgeous, you know, 40-year-old yeah. man the night before. Or maybe it was coconut shrimp night. I don't know. But right. I, I just hope she had a wonderful time before she, she fell she overboard. Into bed or... that night. 
Did she yeah. fall overboard or? or no, uh, she, she died, died and they buried her at sea. You could still oh, do that when she died. No, no, no. Yeah. She died. That's how my great grandfather was buried at sea. Yeah. He died yeah. at the Rock of Gibraltar. Yeah. But, you know, for people who love the kind of books we're talking about tonight, Victoria Holt, Mary Stewart, although oh, Mary yeah. Stewart's were generally contemporary, but still, I mean, contemporary for her time. For her time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Phyllis Whitney wrote, but she was more American. I think mm -hmm. Victoria Holt was. And then, you know, Anya Seton wrote, I swear Catherine probably was my most formative reading experience at some point. Oh, I absolutely. I and I latched on to it because I, uh, you know, my parents are madly into genealogy and I found out she was a direct ancestor. And so, you know, I read it like, oh, family history practically, because, you know, it just, it brought that character so much to life. And yeah. she was such a phenomenal character. Absolutely. Um, she also makes the whole War of the Roses intelligible, if you. <laughs> but, um, anyway, Patrick, anything else? We've been keeping people here past the hour. Not really. Yeah. No. All right. Well, then I'd like to thank all of you who have been watching for your questions and your attention and theoretically your book purchases. Tasha and Deanna, absolutely wonderful to see you. I wish it were in person, but this has been a lovely way to connect. So. Oh, so good to see you too. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Patrick, for the tech help. And thank you, Barbara. Good to see you, Tasha. Tasha, you too. Love to Andrew, because I just saw him, but it's always good to see you too. Um, good night, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.